Hey friends, this is Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous, where we discuss pop culture through the lens of race or gender and sometimes both. I'm your host, Julia Washington, and on today's show, we are discussing Tangled, aka Rapunzel. Tangle released in November of 2010 and features the voices of Mandy Moore, Zachary Levi, Ron Perlman, Jeffrey Tambor, and so many others. But before we get into it, let me reintroduce you to my guest. Kelly Peralt is a graphic designer. She designed the Jelly Pops Book Club logo. She designed the Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous website. She has all kinds of stickers and bo- and hats and there was t-shirts at one point and it's just so much fun stuff and cards and listen, she's just generally brilliant. She was here in season four for our nanny episode and I have recently deemed her our number one super fan because she's always sharing and promoting our content and I am so grateful to her for that and she's here for season five and I'm so glad she's back. Welcome back to the show, Kelly. (laughs) I am so glad to be back. And I feel like your number one fan because I share everything because it's so good. Oh, you're so kind. I recently purchased your introvert hat and somebody like, and I shared about it. And then somebody was like, I need an extrovert hat. And then they were like, wait, just kidding. Extroverts don't need hats. (laughs) Although now I want to make a a, a shirt or a hat or something that says like extrovert, like Fooled you. Yeah. <laughs> Line through it. JK. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Change my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think all of your stuff is brilliant. And I um love following all of the things that you do and all the designs that you do. This won't air until the fall. So I don't know what you'll have up at the time. I'm gonna keep working on t-shirts for sure. I'm yeah. I'm just having so much fun making them. Mm-hmm. It's fun. And if you love our Jelly Pops book club logo, Kelly's why. She (laughs) did it. She did it. And we love it. I'm like, what else can I put it on? I need every, I need it on everything. (laughs) Yes. The letters are perfect. The font is perfect. It's just perfect. (laughs) It's it's not the font. I was like, that's, that's the one. It's very you. The personality matches. I, yeah, man, I love that you said that because I get told to be I'm too loud all the time. Okay, <laughs> let's do a quick summary from the Google on on Tangled. And y'all, you know what? Google has been like crushing it lately. So I'm convinced they hired a new copywriter. Here we go. Beautiful Princess Rapunzel has been locked away in a tower since she was captured as a baby by an old hag. Her magical long blonde hair has the power to provide eternal youth and the evil Gothel, Gothel, Gothel uses this power to keep her young. At the age of 18, Rapunzel becomes curious about the outside world. And when a prince uses her tower as refuge, she asks him to help her escape. Well, that's not entirely accurate because he takes refuge in her tower. And then she's like, hey, I want to see these lanterns that always show up on my birthday day she well she's another lanterns she says i want to see these lights these floating lights or whatever she calls them every year on my birthday if you take me to see them i will give you back this thing you stole and he's like right, yeah he's not a prince i have that, yeah. that's the bone to pick there is like he is not a prince he is a straight up thief <laughs> that's the other pro- okay so google this one you get an f <laughs> Yes. You get an F in the summary department because one, you called her an old hag, not a fan. No. Was she a great person? No, but we don't call women hags. No. This isn't. You can call her evil. Call evil her evil. Perfect. I'm evil a fan is, of that. Evil's perfect for her. Yeah. Leans into it real hard. Yep. Okay. So at the time of its release, the New York Times movie critic A.O. Scott, who we do love at this show, had this to say. Quote, Tangled begins like far too many animated features these days with some annoyingly smart alecky voiceover narration, courtesy of a charming rascal named Flynn Ryder. This temporary hijacking of a princess's tale by her square jawed love interest seems like a crude commercial calculation, a sign to the anxious boys in the audience that things aren't going to be too girly or too 
Disney phobes that the studio can bring some DreamWorks style attitude, which I thought was interesting because he's generally favorable. Anyway, just a quick refresher for those who are not familiar with the Rapunzel story because we are in the age where everything's been readapted, watered down, changed, all the stuff. So it is a Brothers Grimm fairy tale that was first published in 1812, which you guessed it, it's a little more dark than what Disney gives us in Tangled because it's the Brothers Grimm. <laughs> you want dark. You it, it, uh huh. <laughs> this tale includes love, longing, a sorceress, blindness due to falling into a thorn patch, betrayal, and just generally a story that likely sc scarred the children of the 19th century before things started getting sanitized. Sanitized? Sanitized. <laughs> Honestly, the blindness part, I remember that. Like, that's the biggest part I remember from, like, reading it in school as, like, the folk tales. Horrified. The imagery that is in the books for when he becomes blind is seared into my brain. And I went to private religious school. So how y'all, like, there make it make sense. None of y'all wanted to, us to talk about anything, but yet you let us read Brothers Grimm. Like, we learned mm -hmm. creationism, not evolution, but yet y'all taught us Brothers Grimm. I mean, there is a, I mean, there is a long history of using fear. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now that I'm so, getting old, yeah. <laughs> but yes, also like, yeah, the idea of like, it's fairy tales are wholesome. Like, no, they're not. <laughs> they're wholesome through disney's eyes yes okay so now that we're all up to speed we're gonna get into it between the mixed reviews mtv calls this the greatest princess movie of all time and the religious sect claiming there are religious themes in this film i think we need to kick off at the very beginning for both of us what is your overall opinion about this film so i it's it's my favorite you said it was released in 2010. Mm -hmm. I also left an abusive marriage in at the end of 2010 after watching this movie. <laughs> I well, don't, girl, I kind of love that. <laughs> I don't think that the, they were directly connected, but I don't think they were unconnected. Sure. <clears throat> I have a like visceral memory of being, I'd had a car accident, not mobile, not not very mobile. I could get up and walk around, but like I couldn't drive anywhere. I was kind of stuck at home and I was not happy in this home and a lot of movie watching and this happened to have just come out and I'm watching it and I'm not happy and I'm absorbing these lessons like I was like oh this is really cute and then days later I decided this isn't working it's not gonna be good for me if I stay here and that was the beginning of my turned out to be escape <laughs> yeah this unhappy relationship unhappy home unhappy life that I was like had just dove headfirst into yeah been recently married and it didn't last long yeah um, so because it does paint like it's I mean it is a cartoon it's not gritty realism <laughs> but it's not brothers as, grim <laughs> it's not brothers grim but like as far as Disney goes like it has some darkness to it and like I can appreciate that and it does a good job of showing a relationship that is not an okay, healthy relationship and saying, this is not an okay, healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And the character at the end comes to realize that. And I love seeing that in a film. I think it's important for people to see people leaving relationships mm -hmm. in addition and to joining, entering. Like It's always about like the relationship that is built at the end, but also and more arguably arguably more important part of the story is the relationship that is broken at the end. Right. Because one of the things that I thought was really beautiful about this story, because 2010, my son was five or six, and that was a really hard year for me as well. So we didn't see it in theater. And I don't think I ever saw it with him. I think that this ended up being one of the ones in rotation in his after school care at his school. <clears throat> But if we didn't see it in theater, then it would, you know, pass. But one of the things that I thought was really beautiful about this film was how she slowly pieces together the abuse her alleged mother is putting her through. Like, everything's normal to her. Nothing is abnormal. She thinks this is the way she's supposed to be living. She believes that her mother loves her. 
She, you know, asks for minimal things in her life. And to, for the most part, the mother provides it until she wants to see the lights that happen on her birthday every year. And then it's a lot of manipulation from the mother. And, you know, the age that we are now, it's very clear, right? Oh, yeah. But like, for you, yes, there's some signs. But for me, I don't know if I would have recognized it as manipulation right away. 13 years ago, how old was I? I can't do that kind of math. I was in my 20s. <laughs> yeah. 26. I did it. There we go. And so I just, I just really appreciate how it sort of shows how it can feel normal to be in a unhealthy relationship. And the reason why the control exists is so you don't think about it. Yes. And then once you have some sort of outside element and you start sort of comparing and critically thinking about, oh, that's interesting. How does that compare to my, because that's a natural thing we as human beings do. We're generally curious people. I think that that's a dying art form because of the way that we choose to function nowadays. But she does start sort of like seeing the light a little differently once they do sort of remove themselves because Ryder steals the princess crown, mm -hmm. has to hide in her tower. The only way into her tower is through being lifted up in her hair. But then also he just like climbs the tower, which feels like a very adventurous boy thing to do adventurous person thing to do I would never I'm risk adverse <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like take me to see and like she's in the travels to go see the lights for her birthday she they encounter so many different things and she starts thinking about like her relationship with Ryder and how different that feels compared to like her relationship with her alleged mother and her and then and then like the horse and then like the bad guy and like all these things where then she starts to realize like oh this actually over here feels better than what mother's been doing like I thought mother was love but it turns out that's not it yes and like that's a huge thing is like finding out like oh this is like what you think is love and what what your whole world has told you is love and what your whole world has told you it means to love another person because mm -hmm. you might be loving another person who is not loving you back, but your first lessons are, but I need to be loving. And if I love someone else then they, they will treat me like treat people, how you want to be treated, you know? And that lesson is not always true where it's like, if I treat someone how I want to be treated, they'll treat me that way back. And it doesn't always happen. That's a really hard lesson right. to learn. But also I just picked up on something that you had said that I hadn't noticed. I've seen this movie so many times. I have two daughters that are five and seven and I've watched all the Disney movies so many times. Yeah. But you said a couple times that she sees the light. Like she goes to see the lights. Mm -hmm. She also at the end of the movie ends up literally seeing the light about what her real situation is, mm -hmm. where she is. And also that is the song in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I saw the light is like, that is the movie's song. And how I never put that together, I don't, Big fail on my part like I just, it feels very obvious now and I'm just like mm, that's great well you know sometimes when you watch something over and over and over again you just intrinsically know it and you don't verbalize it yes you don't it's, see it for the trees right it's it's just part of it yes 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 and it does a good job of also sorry I want to no go ahead I was thinking about this too is it shows a good um it, I mean it's, it's a condensed version obviously because Two hours is not enough time to actually decondition yourself from an abusive relationship. Right. But it shows that her progression pretty well. She doesn't just walk out of the tower and decide I'm a new person. Like she, it shows a whole scene where she is struggling and arguing with herself and beating mm -hmm. herself up almost literally. And like, you know, having a, like a, a legit mental breakdown as soon as she leaves the tower, like that first yeah. like step away. And like, that is real. It's, it, it feels true, even if it doesn't feel literally timeline realistic. Mm -hmm. like, that is, it feels very true to the experience of leaving a bad situation that you didn't realize was bad. Mm -hmm. That first step is like, oh, I'm doing something bad here. 
is how it feels. And like, I love that they showed that and showed her like, kind of like pushing past it. And, and also like, I mean, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, she didn't do it alone. Right. And I think that's an important part. Right. And there comes the love part of it too, where the way that relationships develop, because again, my favorite trope is enemies to lovers. <laughs> that is my favorite trope in the whole wide world. I love hating people and then falling in love with them. <laughs> I don't know if I should admit that out loud, but I just did. But like, I there's a point in the movie where she like, cause Flynn's like kind of protective over her. Like at first it doesn't feel like he is, but then over time he's like realizing like, oh, she really has no life experience. So like, I've got tons of life experience. So like, we got to get this. And, you know, it turns into you know, this actual love and care situation and becomes more than just, I need the crown back kind of mm -hmm. um, scenario. And what I loved, I think, a lot within that is that it's not like, I mean, it's only over a couple of days. So <laughs> I want, because I wanted to say, oh, it's a slow growth. It's a slow progression. It's not because it's over a couple of days, but they experience something together yes. that is formative for her. And so that creates trust between the two of them. And well, so he doesn't just save her like there's a lot of her saving him throughout the film too and I think he talks about like his past in the orphanage mm -hmm. and his past. like there is mutual helping right him, which is feels very important yeah so. yeah because they're leaning on each other like he's not rescuing her he's not saving a damsel in distress they're on a mission together and yeah. and they're learning about each other and sort of like okay so here's where she's hit being you know able to lean on him and he's where he's and it shows that it needs to be two-sided in that way and I think that's a lot of the contribution to her realizing like oh her mother is selfish yeah because it's like she's not really getting this kind of love and support from her mother she's getting it from writer mm -hmm. and plus all the people that they're meeting who are helping them you know on top of that right like it's I don't know it just feels like it feels less and I've already said this it feels less damsel in distress and more like girl we got you yeah, yes it's like she experiences what real like care and support actually is which gives mm -hmm. her that like ability to later when the mom shows up and is like get back home she's like actually like what you're doing is wrong and I know that now you know yeah. and also oh also when um she wraps the hair around his hand and you know and he freaks mm -hmm. out like of course it's played up for laughs because like her hair glows and stuff but also I think he's freaking out because oh my god someone just helped me like no one has ever helped right. me before and I feel like that is an important but like very quick throwaway easy to miss thing is like being able to recognize actual care when you aren't used to it is mm -hmm. it's hard to see mm -hmm. um and like it's an important thing that they added in the yeah as well and it, it's foreshadowing for a later scene which we can get into in a bit as i mentioned before mtv in 2015 claimed this to be the greatest disney princess movie of all time and includes reasons like it defies the damsel in distress trope which we just talked about mother being the most messed up villain of all time that Mandy Moore is the best ever and that the music is unmatched. So let's get into it. Whether or not we agree with MTV, keeping in mind that a number of films have been released since this 2015 article from Disney in the princess world. And I'm just like, oh, what are they? And I had a list on my handwritten paper and I don't know what they are without my handwritten paper. Well, I wrote down some, so I'm just going to kind of read off what I wrote instead Thank of being in here, but like, so a lot's happened since 2015. We have gotten Moana, we've gotten Mirabelle, we've gotten a return of Elsa and Anna. We've got some other ones in there. I didn't do an exhaustive list, but like those four for sure, like came back and Elsa and Anna, I think changed in the second film. Oh, Frozen 2 is so much better. Oh, it's so good. I have, like... I also have thoughts about that for sure. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a whole different movie. It's a whole different vibe. Um, but 
those characters all serve a story on their own. And like, for me, I'm not great at picking my favorite of anything ever. Like my girls, it's a game. Like what's your favorite color today, mom? Cause I know yeah. it's different than yesterday. Like I don't have favorites. I just have like what works mm-hmm. for me right now. What is working and serving me best right now? Um, also maybe I'm just fickle. It's also possible, but it's just how, like, how is Rapunzel best? Um, best for who? Mm -hmm. I still think that she's the best one for me because of my history and life and values and all that. Um, Not to say the other ones aren't also good and good lessons for me to learn, but like that was the the lesson that was the biggest in my life. Um, Mirabelle, she's best at showing kids how to navigate not feeling good enough. Um, Mm. Adults are best at helping people learn that maybe love isn't romantic. Um, Moana is the best character to illustrate the importance of doing frightening things and trusting yourself instead of just listening to other people's opinions of you. Yeah. Rapunzel is the best one at showing someone who stood up for themselves when they were faced with someone else who was determined to make them feel small and worthless. Mm. All of those stories need to be told. All of those stories are my favorite. Um, yeah. But Rapunzel is probably always going to be like my, like mm, right here. Cause yeah. that's what I needed to see when I needed to see it. Or that's what yeah. I saw when I most needed to see it. And 2010. So it makes me think that Rapunzel walked so the others could run because prior to 2010, I'm trying to think of the princesses, like, especially the princesses that you and I had, because we're not that far apart in age. Like we had Ariel, we had Belle, we had fucking everyone from our mother's generation, Snow White, Cinderella, they did a Pocahontas movie that you can question considerably for lots and lots of reasons beyond yes. the princess trope. And those, and those stories at their times, I think, did serve a purpose. They forward, they furthered things. Like, I mean, looking back now, like looking at like Belle and it's like, oh, she's weird because she reads. It's like, ouch. No, ouch. Stockholm Syndrome. It's Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> Stockholm you can't Syndrome. tell me otherwise. <laughs> yes, like... Are there problems? Yes. But at the same time, like Belle was also maybe one of the first princesses who like had an inner life. Right. So, like, you're taking the, like you have like where you're stepping from, like Rapunzel, I think changed things a lot. I think you're mm-hmm. right. Um, and it's getting, it's just upward trajectory. Uh, yeah. Cause I really did like, I was like, man, I wish I had watched this sooner. Cause um, I'm not gonna lie. It's the first time I watched it. And I'm the whole time and I'm listen, and I have a, like many people specifically born in 1984, I have a very strange relationship with Mandy Moore because she also is an 84 baby. And so like, we literally were like my, I remember this very distinctly, my friend group and I at the time were very critical of her because there was like, she did a music video and she was driving in the car and we were like, she's not fucking old enough to drive. Like, what is this shit? And it wasn't her. It was the decisions, but we didn't know that at 15. No. Yeah. So it's like, it's like one of those things where you're just like, oh, I got to deprogram my frustration with Mandy Moore and her career because it's not her fault. Right. <laughs> Which is probably one of the reasons why I was like, I'll pass at the time. But I do, I, well, I should say did. I did love Zachary Levi. <laughs> he is currently in timeout. <laughs> I was very disappointed to learn. Uh-huh. Anyway. But I was watching it over the weekend to prepare for our chat. And I was just like, I feel like this is a theme that really holds up in a way that like will be timeless because it doesn't feel preachy. It doesn't feel like it's spoon feeding you some sort of lesson. To me, it felt like there was one thing where I was just like, if they don't fucking tie this in, I will actually lose my shit. And that's the tears because in Rapunzel, it's her tears that bring him back his sight. That's the healing component. And then they live happily ever after. And I loved that shit when I was a little girl. I just thought that was so tragically romantic oh yeah it's it's in the movie it's perfect so like once i'm sorry to interrupt but like and also like isn't there like some research or something and i mean this could be an apocryphal like random social media i'm on the internet too much thing but i thought i had read that like tears like the the makeup of tears like changes based on like your emotions right like oh the the 
the composition of your tears is different than when you're just like yawning and some like tears come out. Like it's different. Maybe fact check me on that. But I think I, I like I think speaks to like the power of tears and crying. And yeah, you know. I like that theory. It, I want it to be true because I definitely am more emotionally connected to tears and sadness and joy than I am in yawning. That's for sure. Um, so like, even if it's not necessarily true, like crying is cathartic. We know mm -hmm. that and tears do have power, whether we like it or not, whether it's like scientifically provable or not. Like I love the, the symbolism of like tears as like a powerful thing when like it tends to be like, Oh, you're crying. And it's like an unempowering thing. Yes. And I think that's why in the Grimm's version, I maybe didn't understand why I loved it so much as a kid. But as an adult, when I look back on my childhood and just the amount of crying was involved and just the amount of shame that was placed on for crying. And then you have Rapunzel healing the love of her life through her tears was really just like one of those things that like became part of my DNA because it really is there. Like you said, crying is cathartic. There really is something very powerful about allowing your emotions to surface in that way and then processing them and then accepting them or figuring out what you need to do next. And so when it got to the point, cause I thought Disney did a great job because you can't have, you know, writer fall into a bed of thorns <laughs> eyes first that's yep. gonna scare a lot of kids not disney um, <laughs> it's not a disney vibe um so it you know instead it's mother stabbing him and then she, she's like let me wrap my hair around you and he's like you can't do that you will die and just the sacrifice in that and him saying that and then her like and then she in all these things it's like if the tears don't fucking heal him i'm gonna mm -hmm. hate this movie and then she cries, it lands in his cheek, you see the glow. And I was like, that's it. This movie is perfect. I'm so happy. Like, this is this is 13 years later. This movie is aged beautifully. I have no notes. Yep. I mean, it couldn't have it couldn't have been a more perfect ending because it had like, I mean, maybe it could have. I'm not a screenwriter. And but, like, it feels like it hit all the notes. And I love that it's not the I love you because that's what you needed in Beauty and the Beast for him to mm -hmm. no longer be Beast. It had to be an I love you. It is a silent moment where they actually don't know that they're in love with each other. They're still figuring it out, but they know they want each other in their lives. And she is so deeply hurt by her friend and the prospect of him dying that she still has this power to heal and she still like uses her power but doesn't realize she's using it because she didn't understand that the power wasn't just in her hair yes but she does now the power yeah well and the power like that whole like the power was in her she, hey dorothy you had the power all along <laughs> right i do kind of hate though when he cuts her hair and it's like this really shitty haircut oh my like God. you yeah. couldn't have cut it like you could come on guys like, like you couldn't have done it here, like a little here. lower like she's got 70 feet of hair <laughs> like now she's gonna have a horrible haircut the rest of her life that alone i'd be like you know what fuck you i'm not marrying you look what you did to my hair <laughs> right you gave me the worst haircut my first haircut <laughs> of my life and it was the worst one it's the worst one it's never growing back <laughs> yes i'm just kidding but also, um, <laughs> so after I left my abusive relationship, I did get a pixie cut. That is a <gasps> general thing. When you, yeah. leave a, when you leave a bad relationship, what do you do? You cut all your hair off. Yep. So it kind of tracks, but also like she didn't get to decide it. And I don't love that. Right. But in the context, it's like, well, okay. I get why. Yeah. 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 I love that it was a pixie cut just for that reason. It's like every girl either cuts bangs or pixie cut or both or both
Okay, so I want to discuss the themes of this film and what themes you were cued into when you watched it. Um, well, kind of, we kind of already talked about. I know we of- did. That's the problem with oh. the digression I do. We do oh, in my yeah, show. So, so <laughs> uh, but yeah, like the, mainly the themes of like self confidence and self value are pretty pretty high up there. Um, also, you know, we haven't talked about. I don't think is the, the I have a dream mm. part where it's like having a dream is important, but uh, the importance of having a dream and not being afraid to go for it as someone who. I dream big and I can't seem to do anything halfway uh, speaks to me pretty strongly. Um, That is my favorite musical number. I I do like the, I see the light, but the ruffians and I've got a dream. Like I, I love it. I love seeing all these big, burly, scary ass dudes see how they want to do interior decorating. Like that, like that speaks to me also because like, that is also kind of part of what I do, right? Like professionally, like I, I do branding and websites and the reason that I love doing that, where it's not just like, I'm going to slog through, like I enjoy every single person I work with. Cause I'm like, I'm helping make your dream come true. And in a small way, I'm helping contribute to someone making their dream come true. And like, I love when I see someone doing something ridiculous right seemingly ridiculous like again this guy in the one of the ruffians collecting unicorns and wanting to be time and like these unrealistic dreams that like at the end of the movie you see all of them accomplishing their dreams they all made their dreams come true they didn't have to add that in at the end that could have just rushed right past it but they showed like at least five or six of them playing the piano and being a mime and like they actually like narrated their dreams coming true Um, and I think that's really important and I think it was important that they showed the type of people whose dreams were coming true as well like and the type of dreams that they were having come true it's like oh you you know your dreams don't have to be what you thought they were your dreams don't have to be what someone told you they should be your dreams don't have to be prescribed by your type right? Like, oh, you're a big burly guy. You should want to do big burly tough things. Like, you know, I think that that was something that is also maybe a turning point where you're like, where Disney is breaking out of stereotypical roles and, and letting one stereotype be something outside of, of their type. Yeah. Yeah. That was, and I think an important thing to show. Yeah, because these big burly guys had a gentle and understanding side. Because at first, when they meet Ryder, they're like, money. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, she sort of helps you. She starts, you know, uh, Rapunzel starts talking about her dream. Like you say, they have this big mus- musical number where you learn all these in- intimate details about them that you're just like, wow, I never would have guessed by looking at you. And then at the end of that musical number, they're like, all right, kid, you're cool. Help the girl. And they continue to be a source of relief for them through the rest of the movie. Uh And I love that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) My favorite, I know this isn't a theme thing, but my favorite character growth was the horse. (laughs) God, the horse. Yes. I forget his name. Maximus thank you and like how he's like he's very much a workhorse in the beginning he's a palace horse and he's like I will get you Flynn Rider Rider (laughs) Flynn whatever the fuck his name is I will find you I will hunt you down I am smelling your scent I got you you piece of shit and then as the movie progresses he realizes like oh no this person is an actual human there's things here I'm watching him grow. He's got a good heart. His thievery isn't necessarily because he's thieving because he's a bad guy. He's thieving because he's got to make his, you know, he's got to survive, which is pretty much we're all going to be thieving soon because if capitalism keeps going the way it's going. I know why you love it. I know why you love his progression because it's friends to lovers. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's a hundred percent friends to lovers (laughs) because by the end of it he's just like 
my human and you're like yes yes, my <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. also i do love that scene where he like throws in the apples when they're going out on the boat he throws in the apples and he's like i didn't steal or i paid for him mostly and yeah. like, oh no because he's such a rule <laughs> follower and he's like i can't break the rules and it's like baby it's fine <laughs> like, yes. yes i think though that that helped him break the rules more later he's like well i've already broken the one yes yes yeah oh it's so cute he's just the cutest every time he came up on and he's a character with no lines but he has such a big personality it's so great oh yeah credit to the animators for like every single communication that max did because yes very expressive so good it's so good love 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 being the mom of girls how does this movie hit differently now in this phase of life? Oh, it hits way harder. It's like the really? same, but like so much intensity. Yes. Really? Tell me well, more. Now I'm in, I mean, not a reflection on how I actually parent, but like just the, just the fact of being a parent, I am now in danger of being in the role of Mother Gothel. Mm. That is that's a terrifying prospect right of like oh crap I could be a bad mom I could be a bad mom to girls Mm -hmm. I could be a bad mom to who I was as a kid like that's terrifying um and not that (laughs) not that I embody anything that Mother Gothel did yeah I was gonna say you and Mother Gothel could not be more opposite (laughs) no but like every parent gets angry and like yells at their kid every time I get like angry or frustrated with my kids I'm just like Am I doing something that's going to damage them in their future? Are they going to talk about this to their therapist? Which I think is a, is a very normal mom thing. But like Mother Gothel is um, like a clone character, right? That we can like look at in life. Like characters are reflections of us one way or another, or they can't be. And in this case, like you don't see much of Rapunzel's actual mom. Like she has no lines. She's just kind of there because she had to bring her into the world and get her back at the end but like there's no actual like parenting that you see from them the only parenting you see in this movie is bad parenting Um, and it is you know it it is a little bit like a a warning and like don't treat your kids like this um and the the song that she has the mother mother knows best like every parent has done like because i said so Mm -hmm. there's a whole movie mandy moore stars in called because i said so (laughs) yes and like i try to avoid the because i said so but also answering like the fifty thousand whys all the way down it's like at some point it's like because and and so like this movie it is definitely different watching it as a parent when the only parent in this whole movie is a terrible one such a narcissist like the whole point of her like stealing Rapunzel is because Rapunzel's mother was given this healing plant during pregnancy because she was unwell and so like now Rapunzel embodies all of those healing powers and because this woman again shitty shit that society puts us through only feels value because when she's young and beautiful steals a child Mm-hmm. to use those powers to keep her young and beautiful <laughs> yes and yes and there's also like the loaded like i i don't know if you ever heard it being being a boy mom but um as a girl mom hearing a lot from when i was pregnant with my first girl mm-hmm. you know the phrase oh girls they steal your beauty i when I tell you I hated that the first time I heard it oh my god like it's like society go ahead because I think we're gonna say same thing we're I mean we pit women against each other so much and then like we even do it between mothers and their unborn children Mm -hmm. I could have screamed but I think I was at work (laughs) like yeah like it's it's like that setting up for failure on purpose and it's not even anything we did it's outside elements Mm -hmm. and it's I feel like the same with our relationships too like I didn't get that kind of stuff but I got are you gonna try for a girl because boys won't care for you when you're old 
boys don't care. Boys aren't caring. Boys aren't loving. Boys aren't nurturers. Yes. Oh my gosh. And well, it's also, like, yeah. why the like, why the fuck do you think I'm gonna raise my kids like that? Exactly. Like what? Like what? So much is being shifted onto my responsibility here. That is just like, first of all, some of it I can't fight because it's it's the water we swim around in. Right. Like second of all, just like it's most oftentimes not true. Like inherently, boys and girls are caring because mm-hmm. they're people. Because mm-hmm. we all need to be connected. Um, but also, like I, I get the oh, you're so lucky you have girls. They're so easy. I'm like no, they're not. No, they're like oh, they're so. They're, but they're so sweet. Like they're not gonna tear your house up. Like come over and look at my house. <laughs> Literal crayon all over the wall. My youngest drew a, a mural in the hallway. Love it. I mean, it's still there because I don't have the heart to get rid of it. Sure. But yeah, I totally understand. I mean, it's wild. <laughs> it's wild, these preconceived notions. And what's crazy, Kelly, is like the older I'm getting. So like, you know this all because you are one. All of my friends, kids are 10 years at minimum younger than my child. Mm-hmm. I came into parenting early. All of my friends came into parenting at the time one should when they're ready ish (laughs) like not an unemployed 19 year old with no job skills who's a junior college dropout that's not ideal um and so like now I'm fighting I don't know where this shit is coming from Kelly I do not think this way this has never been how I thought but I'm actively trying to work against all the shit that the generation before us said to us in general, like sometimes I'll be walking and I'll be, and I'll want to say something like, where the fuck did that come from? That's not what I believe. Like, why do I feel the need to say insert? I I can't think of a statement off the top of my head because it's not, because it's not a part of my DNA, but for some reason I'm in target seeing a a mom. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, what, that's not the reaction that I, would have like where did that come from and then I'm like is it because I'm pushing 40 is this why my brain is starting to think this way I don't like this I think it's conditioning I've also heard it's not my phrase but it's it's something like the first thing you think is not how you actually feel the first thing you think is how you learned to react the second thing you think is how you actually feel Okay. Even, like the first thing you say, or what you know, the first thing you say is is your knee jerk reaction. It's your conditioning. The second thing is when you've had a second, you take a beat to think about it, and that's your actual feelings on it. Which and is what we all need to do more often, I think. And I've definitely started working on the whole like I'm not going to respond immediately. That was such a good lesson, and I'm still I also still working on it. But like learning, like oh, I don't have to answer right away. <laughs> I can take a minute to think about it. And especially now when we have all these non-immediate means of communication, we're not, we don't have to be having a phone conversation where everything is an immediate back and forth, mm-hmm. we have, you know, or even right here, we're on a zoom chat and we are, I also had time to get my thoughts together before we talked about it. I have things written down. I had time to think about what I was going to say before I said it, like mm-hmm. excuse now to just knee jerk our way through life. <laughs> Right. And I really do appreciate people who do take a beat because I was in a communications class one time when they told us something to the effect of like, sometimes, you know, you stop listening when you start developing your response and you just start to develop your response, like halfway through somebody saying something to you. And I thought, well, that's shitty because we all want to be heard. We also all want to talk. So it's like, it's like, You know, it's like we deserve to be heard. So like, pause, take it in, develop your response once they're done speaking. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is weird too. Like, how does the princess thing, like, because I feel like I love pink. I've always loved pink. I've always loved, like my mom would get so frustrated because I'd wear my frilly Sunday socks with bows on them out on a Tuesday to go play kickball in the mud with the neighbor kids because I wanted to be pretty but also play in the dirt so like I think for me when I reflect on 
my mom was probably like, she's a tomboy, but she also loves to wear pink and dresses. <laughs> well, yeah, so, we're like, so much alike. I had like, the little like puff sleeve, like the, they had like the crinoline, like yes. underneath they puffed out. Yes. The little like shiny shoes and the uh-huh. over socks with the lace on them. Like that was my daily wear to school thing. My mom would be like, but why do you come home and co- or you're covered in dirt and you have scrapes on your legs? Like, what did you do? I'm like, I jumped off the jungle gym. It was awesome. Like, what else are you supposed to do? That's what the jungle gym is for. And like, I don't remember there ever being sort of this indoctrination because even in adulthood, it was like, oh no, I want the pretty. And whenever like, I and, and at home, it's like, I want casual, but I still want it to be pretty. Like, I never when I did a lot of internal learning of myself, it, the root was always like, I I need shit to be pretty. (laughs) You know what though? I wonder if that's not the default. When little boys want things that are pretty, they just get in trouble. That's true. Which is getting in trouble. Little boys also like, like I have friends with, with boys and like little boys also like pretty things. They are just like embarrassed out of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It sucks. And like, yeah. so that's that I, I'm trying to, I mean, I don't have boys, so I'm not working on that aspect, but like with my girls, I'm just like, they have, so I don't usually buy the frilly dresses because I don't usually buy most of their clothes anymore. Like grandmas are coming through every week with, <laughs> with new clothes for these girls. Like they are the only like granddaughters and only yeah, the only granddaughters on both sides, the only grandkids on one side. So like they buy them all kinds of yeah. fun, really things. And like they have bought like fancy dress, like the, here's your Easter dress. And like, mm-hmm. okay, after you wear it for Easter, it's just sitting in the closet and we're going to like keep it in a, you know, yeah, perfectly sanitary environment. No, they're going to yeah. wear that and they're going to get it dirty and they're going to get paint on it. And, and I really like, I I realized like oh I'm really trying to keep these in like a hermetic sealed environment. Mm-hmm. Like, then my my second reaction was like oh I, I, we don't have to do that. Wear the dress, get it dirty, wreck that shit. And yeah, because there's this show like- them that it's fine to be like you can be girly and also a mess. And yes, those things are both of those things are feminine. Like yes, and I think that's the difference. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why you and I click so well because there are our counterparts who are very pristine and they're like, I don't touch me, your hands. And I have had gone through moments in life. Where I'm like, your hands are sticky. Don't touch me. Like that's a true thing. Period. I don't want to be sticky. all the time. Correct. <laughs> but sure. like, I'm not afraid to be like, what's the word? Like, it wasn't one of those things to me where it felt like when, like I was just, I did an interview about the Barbie movie and my response to the question of like, do you think, Barbie influenced your beauty standards. I was like, and for me, it was like, no, because I just wanted to play pretend. I loved the world. I loved, I could, you know, brush their hair. I loved, I could put them in different clothes because that's what I wanted to do. Like, it wasn't like a here, this is how you should be. It was like, holy shit. There's a doll that lets me do what I want. Kind of thing. Yeah. Acting instead of like just being acted on. Yeah. And I don't know the, di- cause I know there are women out there who feel like that unrealistic standard. And I know we're going through this Renaissance right now where girls are like, I want plastic surgery so I can look like this and you know, all, all that stuff. And like, I think one of the Jenner girls just came out and was like, I wish I had never gotten my boobs done. Cause they were perfect as they were. So yeah. Cause you were 20, yeah. <laughs> your boobs are always perfect at 20. <laughs> like get your boobs done at 45 when gravity's taking over. I don't know, whatever. Um, but like, that's never been my mentality is I've never been, I won't say I've never been negatively, negatively impacted by like the stereo, like the message of what women are supposed to look like because you can't avoid it. But I feel like my survival rate in it was so much higher than some of my peers because it was like, I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. Yeah. I mean, I don't either. Cause I, I also like anyone who was born female has, has had it laid on them at some point because it's not necessarily that you 
for me, it wasn't, I looked at Barbie and went, oh, why am I not exactly like that? It was going through my life and collecting all of these criticisms that I then carried with me Mm -hmm. from other people. Um, Not necessarily anybody saying specifically, oh, you don't look like Barbie, but like, why do you look like this? Why did you do that? That color doesn't look good on you. Oh, why are you wearing that? Like all those things. And I mean, none of this is new information for either Mm -hmm. of us, but yeah, I, I don't think that any one piece of media is at fault for the mountains of things that women carry and struggle with that cause their self-worth to just crumble like it's just everything I had a um an aunt who is large in size and that was always the warning like I do recall that like that was the warning like you don't want to be like that so it wasn't that you needed to be thin it was you just don't want to be like that oh yeah which is interesting. She did have a lot of health problems, but it I don't, I don't, I would argue now because I'm 220 pounds now. And people, when I tell people that they're like, no, you're not. I'm like, go get me a scale. I'll fucking show you. Like we have such a distorted understanding of what weight looks like on different body shapes and size and like heights. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun to watch people just go, what? When I tell them how much I <laughs> weigh. <laughs> the wheels going, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. 220 pounds, you should look like a linebacker. Right. That's what you've been told to think. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Or my personal favorite, when I walk into a yoga class and they think that I look a little too thick and then they're like, wow, you did yoga really well. Fuck you. (laughs) Like, I just want my face get hot. Like, I've been practicing. Right? Like, I've been practicing yoga for 24 years. Of course I survived class. <laughs> you don't know me. You just see a big ass and a little bit of a plump belly, and you think that girl can't bend over. <laughs> and you know what? Like, that's also the conditioning that we go through, right? Like, I hate this and I hate it. I think the um final thing that I'm going to say that I loved about Rapunzel is how when she remembers who she is and she feels the love from her family in that memory. Mm -hmm. And then I fucking wept when they go to the castle and there's no words. It is no, there's no, not a word spoken. The guard comes in, nods his head. Mm -hmm. The mother and the father look at each other. They quickly walk or run. I can't remember. They make their way (laughs) to the balcony. Open the doors. They see Rapunzel and Ryder standing there. They get closer. They step closer. And then she just hugs her. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. I was just weeping. I was like, this is such a beautiful moment of acceptance of it doesn't matter how much time has passed. The reminder of we've never stopped looking for you. And then oh or the as a parent, like, could you imagine? I was like, I hug uh, them so hard when they get home from kindergarten. <laughs> like, yes. I'm like probably Ugh. emotionally sending my child because he leaves the house. And I'm like, I love you. You're my favorite. Make good choices. I can't replace you. I trust you. I don't trust the world. (laughs) Like, and then all that. And then they grab Flynn into the hug. Here's this guy who's been a thief his whole life. Nobody's wanted him either. He stole from them. He's been wanted. We've seen so many wanted posters, and they're just so grateful to have her and and he's the reason why she's back yes weeping (laughs) oh I can't watch anymore like I can't watch the movie anymore without like tearing up at that at least that scene and listen I tell you what I don't know how people can just let their kids go at 18 and be okay like when they're young you can 
control their environment. You know, you can, you sort of have this comfort in knowing that you're guaranteed they're coming. Like there's these little things, right? Where you're just like, I can still protect you. I can still ensure that you're coming home to me in whatever way I can. But once they're 18 and they go to college, you're just like, the world is going to see you as an adult. They don't give a shit about what I've gone through to keep you here, to get you here, to keep you alive, to get you to this point. Oh, yeah. so, and I, and it's just, it makes everything harder about watching family reuniting stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. Or family separation stuff. I was like, this fucking mother gawful stole a baby. I would motherfucking cut a bitch. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's horrifying. Yeah. Which Kel is why that last scene hit so hard. Uh-huh. It's your fault we talked about it. You picked Rapunzel. <laughs> Welcome. Sorry, I've been really... Um... <laughs> I am growing as a person. I used to, like, I would watch all the sad movies and never cry because I was really good at, like, mm, pushing those emotions down. And this, this has been the summer of tears. I watched Barbie and it all just... <sighs> so many tears. I really am into this phase, like my current phase of life, and I'm inviting you along with me. I've always had big emotions mm -hmm. and like a lot of women, and I've always been told that I should not lean into any of that. Mm -hmm. And that just led to me being depressed. So now I'm like, if I'm going to cry, I'm going to fucking cry. If I'm going to be aggressive in my language because I'm angry, I'm going to be aggressive in my language because I'm angry. You do not get to dictate how much I feel in this emotion. Because guess what? The alternative is depression. And then guess what happens from there? I destroy everything in my path. <laughs> Would you not want the depression? Would you like to watch me metaphorically set shit on fire? No? Okay, then let me feel my big emotions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, I know we're talking about Tangled and not Barbie, but like that scene where she talks about, and I, it does make me emotional and that makes me stronger than whatever that scene was. In the yeah. Beginning. Yes, absolutely. I want more of that. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, there's so much this. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to lean into now thanking you so much for coming back to the show, for being the number one fan, for always supporting us, for always being at the book clubs, for always showing up to like all the stuff that we do. Uh, Kelly. I love it here. I love it here. <laughs> it's a great place to be. It, we, no jokes. I love it here. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to go cry now. It's fine. <laughs> Big emotions. Okay, Big crying, emotions. Is, crying is powerful. It is. We just spent an hour talking about that. <laughs> okay, please tell everybody where they can find you, keep up with you, and support your work online. All right. Yes, you can find me on Instagram mostly. I am also on my own website. They are both uh, pleasantcreative.co. And I'm also on TikTok. I have just started talking a little bit more on TikTok about like storytelling because um, I use storytelling a lot in my branding. Um, so it does have a connection. Um, but yeah, I'm also on TikTok, but mostly I'm lurking and sharing stuff in the DMs. <laughs> I'm also a lurker on TikTok these days. <laughs> I've decided I can't make content for a social media anymore. I'm broken. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, and friends, we'll link everything in the show notes. So it's really easy to find Kelly's work. Um, I, like I said, I just ordered it. Well, I don't think I, this is on the recording, but earlier before we started recording, I commented on how I bought an introvert hat, which is what I will be wearing on my morning walks, because I think it's very polite that you said hello to me, but that's it. Don't say any more. I'm on a mission to get two miles in before 7 a.m. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that reminds me. I also have a threadless shop because getting t-shirts onto my actual website was too hard and I didn't want to do it. Oh, I understand that. Okay. So send me that link and I'll link it in the show notes as well and possibly do some shopping. <laughs> All right. Thank you. This was great. I love this. I could talk to you for another hour. <laughs> 
I never would have thought Tangled would be a movie that held up after all these years, but I'm glad it did. I hope you enjoyed this season five opener. We get into some really interesting discussions this season, and I'm excited to share them with you. If you want more, you can join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Julia Washington, and there you'll get bonus episodes every month, a pop culture social hour, and so much more. Just look for the studio audience to your Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous is written and edited by me, your host. And if you've loved this episode, share it with your friends. If you haven't had a chance to check out our sister podcast, Jelly Pops Book Club, now's a great time to do so. The show was created out of our monthly live book club we host. And so if it weren't for our bookish friends, it may never exist. Every episode, we read a book to screen adaptation and compare it to their screen counterparts. Some episodes are solo with just me, some have guests, and it is so much fun either way. Check it out now wherever you get your podcasts. Also, I have a new column with Jennifer Magazine. I will be writing about what I know best, movies, books, and television. I'll link my first piece in the show notes. I write about Michelle Buteau's show, Survival of the Thickest. It's honestly one of the best, smartest, most wholesome shows, yet still pretty fun and edgy on television. Michelle is brilliant. The cast is brilliant. Everything about this show is perfection. It's also loosely based on her collection of essays of the same name. And like I said, it's linked in the show notes, so it will be very easy for you to find it. Friends, I can't thank you enough for tuning in. Until next time.